All right. Hey. Hey, Rose. How are you? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to use my phone. Um, That's fine. We're going to go ahead and get started, Rose. We're actually um, uh, live um, with the program right now, but you sound good. You look good. If that's okay, okay. we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Rose. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. Um, my name is uh, Pat Kane, Public Programs Manager um, with the Museum of the Grand Prairie in Champaign County Forest Preserve District. And I want to thank you all uh, so much for joining us for another great program in our special speaker series. In just a few short moments, I will bring on uh, tonight's presenter, Natalie Lira, uh, to present tonight's program. They never ask. They just tell you after it's done. Sterilization abuses and histories of resistance. Before we do get into tonight's program, I uh, just wanted to go over a few items, promote some upcoming programs, uh, and uh, get us started this evening. Um, on screen with us tonight is Rose Pinpinto. Uh, Rose will be providing American Sign Language interpretation during the program. And I want to thank Rose very much uh, for being here. Um, uh, if you don't know anything about the Museum of the Grand Prairie or the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, Museum of the Grand Prairie opened originally in 1968 as the Early American Museum. And our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois for all generations. Uh, we're a part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District uh, located here in East Central Illinois, a collection of seven forest preserves, uh, two educational facilities, including our museum and the Homer Lake Interpretive Center, uh, Lake of the Woods Golf Course, Kickapoo Rail Trail, and a whole bunch more. Um, in fulfillment of our district's mission to protect Champaign County's natural and cultural resources and inspire people to care for, enjoy, and explore their natural world, uh, Champaign County Forest Preserve District recognizes its responsibility to acknowledge those Native peoples who came before us on this land. Um, we currently work to preserve and tell the story of the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Wea, Miami, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi Nations. Native Americans shape the landscape that the Forest Preserve District sits within. We must recognize that the Forest Preserves occupy the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the peoples previously mentioned, and that they were the first stewards of the land. It's necessary for us to acknowledge these Native nations, to work with them, and to continue to steward the land and educate the public with honor and respect. CCFP will work to be, inclu work to be inclusive of all differences and keep Native peoples and their history at the core of our efforts. Uh, this program is a part of many programs and a special speaker series. Um, this series began um, earlier this summer when we opened up uh, a new exhibit and will continue to include virtual programs like tonight's as well as uh, several others going into the future. And we've already had a handful um, so far this year. Uh, programs are tied to themes and elements present in this new special exhibit at the Museum of the Grand Prairie titled A History of Healing, Infectious Diseases and Community Responses to Defeat Them. Um, opening in May of this year, the exhibit focuses on the local and worldwide impact of such diseases as the 1918 flu, smallpox, malaria, tuberculosis, polio, typhoid, cholera, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19. It also explores uh, developments in local public health and medicine here in Champaign County in East Central Illinois. Um, in addition to examining the impact disease and medicine has had on our health and well-being, uh, the exhibit highlights particular instances in the past as well as the present where local citizens came together during previous epidemics and pandemics for the betterment of their communities. Uh, we encourage you all to come out and visit this special exhibit at our museum if you're local. Our current fall hours have the museum open every day from 1 to 5 p.m. Um, and our museum admission, uh, there is no admission. Our museum is always free. So come out and see us if you're local. I uh, also just want to promote a few upcoming programs in the series, just like tonight's program. All programs will stream live on our Facebook and YouTube pages at 7 o'clock on each of the following dates. And uh, recordings will be available immediately after each program. Uh, tomorrow, 
Um, actually, before I talk about some virtual programs, tomorrow we have an in-person program at the museum, if you're local, on Friday, September 30th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Uh, we'll be unveiling um, uh, what's what's titled as the Healing Hearts Collage. It's a community art piece, community collection art piece, uh, where several uh, uh, dozens and dozens of community members submitted um, pieces and artwork uh, to create this Healing Hearts Collage um, as a part of our new special exhibit, A History of Healing. Um, each of the pieces were collected um, to uh, represent um, uh, individuals' feelings uh, um, uh, towards the multiple pandemics that we're currently facing. So if you're local, come on out and check out this collage, uh, talk to the artists, uh, talk to several of those people who submitted items for the museum's um, uh, Healing Hearts collage. And, and then also you can check out the museum at night, a um, little Friday night action at the museum if you're interested. Um, uh, the next virtual program in the series is going to happen uh, this coming Wednesday, October 5th. Uh, where Gina Roxas, a citizen of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation and the program director for Trickster Cultural Center in Schaumburg, Illinois, will present the program titled Healing Plants, Native American Connections to Nature for Health and Healing. So again, that program is on the evening of Wednesday, October 5th on our Facebook and YouTube pages. One more thing to promote, um, on Thursday, October 27th, the next program in the virtual series will feature Dr. Lynn Curry, a Professor Emerita of History at Eastern Illinois University, and she will present a program titled Kids and Germs, Child Health Reform in the Early 20th Century. Um, for updates and more info on all programs within this series, and then also if you want to check out previous programs and previous recordings, uh, feel free to visit museumofthegrandprairie.org, ccfp.org, or find us on social media. Um, let us know where you're watching from tonight. Some of you are doing that already um, uh, in the comments section, right down below where you're tuning in from. It's always nice to see where folks are watching from tonight. Uh, Brenda's tuning in from Champaign. Uh, Kathleen is tuning in from Canton, although she says she grew up in Champaign. So let us know where you're watching from this evening, if you don't mind, in the comments section below. Also, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop those in the comments section. Uh, we will uh, be monitoring that throughout the chat or throughout the, I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the program, sorry, um, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the program. Um, Sheila's tuning in from Urbana. Hi, Sheila, and Susan is tuning in from Northern Michigan, so thank you all so much for uh, tuning in tonight, and now I do want to bring on our presenter for tonight's program. Um, Natalie, Natalie, hey, how you doing? Um, uh, thank you so much, Natalie, for joining us tonight and presenting as part of the series. Looking forward to tonight's program, learning from you, uh, as well as um, I'm sure um, our audience is, is looking forward to the program uh, as well. So I'm going to introduce Natalie, and then I'm going to turn the show um, over to her. Um, so Natalie Lira is an interdisciplinary scholar and associate professor in the Department of Latina Latino Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Dr. Lira earned her PhD in American culture from the University of Michigan. Her research interests include the politics of reproduction, histories of medicine, and the ways that struggles for racial and reproductive justice intersect. She is an expert on eugenic sterilization, uh, co-director of the Sterilization and Social, Social Justice Lab, and author of the book Laboratory of Deficiency, Sterilization and Confinement in California, from 1900 to 19 to the 1950s. So without further ado, uh, let's turn the show over to Natalie. Thank you again, Natalie, for joining us this evening. Thank you for that introduction and thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, my screen, share a couple of slides. All right. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for attending tonight's event. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I, again, want to thank the museum staff and administration for organizing um, all of this. So today's lecture will explore the history of sterilization abuse in the United States um, with a particular focus on eugenic sterilizations, which really took place from the early 1910s into the 1950s. Um, 
and, and actually later, right, into the 1970s. And what I want to highlight tonight is how state-mandated sterilization became a legitimate public policy. Uh, so how that happened, the role that clinicians and public health officials played in facilitating sterilization abuse, and also the ways that people who were targeted for forced or coerced sterilization have fought back over time. Uh, let's see. So I want to start with uh, the words of three people who were forcibly sterilized during their time as residents of a California state institution called Pacific Colony. And um, a little bit about these quotes. So all of these quotes come from a study that was published by an anthropologist named Robert Edgerton and a clinician uh, named Dr. George Sabov. And they published this article in the journal called Eugenics Quarterly, where they interviewed folks about their views on having been sterilized at this institution called Pacific Colony. And I'll talk more about Pacific Colony later. But um, the, these individuals were not named, um, nor were uh, any other identifying information shared about them. All we have is their quotes and um, their sex. And we know that they were sterilized at some point between the 1930s and the early 1950s. And this first quote comes from a woman um, and she says, gee, I sure would like to have a baby. They never told me that they were gonna do that surgery to me. They said that they were gonna remove my appendix and then they did that other. They should have explained to me. After they did that surgery to me, I cried. I still don't know why they did that surgery to me. The sterilization wasn't for punishment, was it? Was it because there was something wrong with my mind? Uh, the second quote is another woman. Uh, who says sterilization is a terrible thing to do to a woman. They had no right to do that to me. They never ask you about it. They told me that it was just for my appendix and then they did that to me. And then this last quote that I'll share uh, is comes from a man who was sterilized at Pacific Colony. And he says, they shouldn't do that to people just because they're in that hospital. They never ask you, they just tell you after it's done. And so I start with these quotes with the words of eugenic sterilization survivors because their testimonies really highlight a lot, um, many long standing themes in this long history of sterilization abuse in the, in the United States. So the first theme is kind of the deep pain that, um, coerced and forced sterilization caused. So as the first woman's quote uh, shows, she um, she uh, desperately wanted children and the, the, the operation prevented her from doing that. Um, she experienced grief, grief um, mourned for the loss of her reproductive capacity. And as the other woman, you know, clearly states, she says it, it was a terrible thing to do. The second thing that these quotes highlight is the fact that clinicians and medical authorities, you know, not only did they not ask for consent, um, but in many cases they lied outright about the purpose of the surgery. So they state that it was for uh, an appendix removal, right? And this is a lie that um, survivors of sterilization, both from the eugenics era, but later um, sterilization abuse cases repeat over and over that clinicians that operating doctors told them that they were going to have their appendix removed and they um, were actually sterilized. And this is something that is repeated from the early 20th century into the 70s and 80s. Um, the third uh, kind of theme is that folks, the purpose of the surgery was unclear to many, right? So this first wom woman asks whether it was because she was being punished or whether it was for treatment. And the justifications for sterilization kind of um, go back and forth between uh, rationales that align with ideas about, you know, that people should be punished with this um, surgery and also that it's a form of treatment. And the last um, theme is, um, and, and perhaps you know most importantly, is that the the final two quotes really highlight sterilization survivors' stance on the operation. That medical authorities, you know, quote had no right to do that to them. And then the man in the in the final quote uh, states that they shouldn't do that to people. That people shouldn't be forcibly sterilized just because they were committed to a to an institution. And so my research on sterilization abuse in the United States follows the lead of those that experience these practices firsthand. So examining how doctors and clinicians justified stripping people of their, their freedom and their reproductive autonomy, 
And my work also seeks to underscore the ways that people that were targeted for sterilization um, sought to contest medical abuse and to assert their reproductive rights and, and maintain bodily autonomy. So let me take a, a step back here and offer some historical context. So eugenics, um, is often referred to as kind of the science of better breeding. It was a late 19th century effort to really um, combine genetic theories um, in and use them uh, to improve society through reproductive control. And eugenics was established by um, an English scientist and statistician named Francis Galton, uh, famously a cousin of Charles Darwin. Um, and this eugenics um, really rested on the notion that both desirable and undesirable human traits were largely hereditary and that by identifying these traits and then controlling their spread through um, managing people's reproductions you could both um, eliminate um, negative traits uh, by preventing people who were defective from reproducing and allow positive traits to proliferate by encouraging, um, you know, ideal uh, humans, uh, encouraging them to reproduce. So it's commonly understood as a pseudoscience because eugenics rested on faulty methods and faulty assumptions. But I, I like to encourage folks to understand that eugenics was taken as a serious scientific endeavor for many for several decades right and um it had a lasting impact on the way that scientists and physicians and clinicians and and even the american public would come to understand um both how genetics works and the social implications of genetics and a lot of eugenic assumptions infiltrated and and persist in medical practice and one of the principal beliefs um that's embedded in, in eugenics and that proliferates and, and persists is the belief that large social problems so things like poverty um, crime and immorality, that these problems can be addressed if we could only control the reproduction of certain people. So if we can prevent the wrong people from reproducing, then we could somehow address large social problems. And eugenics was, um, you know, enticing, uh, particularly for scientists and legislators and um, much much of the public because it correlated with already existing beliefs, you know, namely that there are inherently superior and inferior populations. And um, these ideas about fitness, who was fit and who was unfit to reproduce, um, correlated very strongly with already existing hierarchies of race, class, um, and ability and disability. Um, and approaches to reproductive control really varied. So they included things like marriage restriction, uh, eugenicists were successful in intervening in immigration restriction, specifically um, the Immigration Act of 1924, the Johnson Reed Act, um, institutionalization, so the, the creation of these large um, public um, institutions um, where people with um, mental illnesses and disabilities were confined, and then of course sterilization at the very extreme end. Um, so the first eugenic sterilization law was actually passed in Indiana in 1907, but it really wasn't until 1927 that sterilizations really ramped up in the country. And um, it's because that year the Supreme Court decided in favor of forced sterilization with its opinion on the Buck v. Bell case, which um, revolved around the case of a teenager named Carrie Buck, who... Um, Virginia state authorities claimed needed to be sterilized because they described her as promiscuous, they described her as feeble-minded. And these claims were backed by faulty IQ testing and uh, Carrie, who was a teenager, her pregnancy, which was the result of a rape, and also accusations about her mother um, being a prostitute, assertions that her infant daughter was abnormal, and, and really the entire family was framed as dysgenic, as having bad genes. Um, and uh, 
in his opinion, uh, in, in the case, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes famously asserted that, you know, sterilization was appropriate in this case and that the state had a right to sterilize because, quote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. And so this with this Supreme Court uh, decision, which had never been ov overturned, uh, the, the court really legitimizes compulsory sterilization as an important way to protect public welfare and public health. And they effectively give the green light to other states to follow suit. And so, um, you know, eugenic sterilization laws pass in other states. They empower state authorities to forcibly sterilize people deemed eugenically unfit. Um, and this map and the slide uh, illustrates the states that had eugenic sterilization laws on the books by 1935. Um, in all, 32 states passed this type of um, eugenic legislation. And under these laws, approximately 60 people were sterile, or 60,000 people were sterilized. Um, and about 20,000 of those sterilizations happened in California. So in my work with the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab, we've really been working on examining this history of eugenic sterilization uh, through interdiscipl interdisciplinary and collaborative research methods. And our research right now focuses on California, Michigan, Iowa, North Carolina, and we recently added Utah. And what we're doing is um, co collecting data on people that were sterilized in these states under these eugenic laws and creating comparable data sets. Um, and these data sets contain information on gender, on age, um, racial categories that were used, diagnoses, uh, but also information on consent practices or the lack of consent practices, ideas about immorality, criminalization, just a whole, as much information as we can get on the people that were sterilized and the justifications that were used to sterilize them. Um, and so, you know, as you'll notice uh, in this chart, um, in this graph, you know, California is by, by far the state that performed the most sterilizations. Again, 20,000 out of the 60,000, so about a third of all operations that occurred in the country. Um, and a lot of my research uh, really highlights disability and ableism as key roles in eugenic sterilization programs, both in California, but across the country. And so in this slide, you will see a table that lists the eugenic criteria for sterilization in different states. Um, so eugenicists built on already existing prejudices and hierarchies of race, class, and gender. But sterilization laws do not explicitly say, you know, we're going to target poor people, we're going to target people of color, we're going to target immigrants, we're going to target, you know, um, you know, uh, single women, single mothers, right? Uh, instead, they used diagnoses or, or disability labels like this label, uh, feeble mindedness. Uh, they used um, uh, insanity, epilepsy, ideas around mental defect. Um, these were the um, vehicles that were used to mark people as unfit to reproduce. Um, so in other words, you know, disability as a concept was really central to rationalizing state interventions like, like sterilization. And this was especially true in California and, and was one of the reasons why California was one of the states that was able to perform so many sterilizations. Um, it's the under California's uh, eugenic law, medical doctors and clinicians of state hospitals and institutions had a lot of power to make decisions over who would be subject to sterilization. So only people that were committed to state institutions were subject to the law. And once you were committed to a state institution, you could be sterilized at the discretion of a clinician or um, superintendent. Um, as you might have guessed, based on the survivor testimonies that I shared earlier, consent was not a requirement. Um, and part of that was because in being committed to a state institution, people were deemed incompetent and they became a ward of the state. And so again, with, through this process, we get a sense of how disability labels were really used to diminish individuals' rights over 
decisions regarding treatment and decisions about their own bodies and their reproductive futures. Um, given that sterilizations largely largely occurred in state institutions, it's you know it's important to study how these diagnoses and these labels really work to justify reproductive constraint. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of my research, I look at uh, things like these uh, sterilization request forms that are shown on this slide, um, which reveal the ways that clinicians kind of built these um, medical narratives to justify sterilizing folks. California's sterilization program is an, a case study because of the number of sterilizations, but it also shows how race and disability and gender converged in this state program um, and how public health workers, um, institutional authorities, social workers, educators, um, and clinicians really built and enforced uh, this logic that uh, was used to target and confine um, and sterilize uh, low-income people, people of color, um, and um, disabled people in California. And one of the studies that we've um, uh, worked on uh, with my colleagues in the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab is a, an analysis of the sterilization requests and comparing those uh, that data to census data. And in that analysis, we um, documented the ways that Spanish surname women and men, most of whom were Mexican origin, were disproportionately sterilized throughout the state. So um, in my recent book, I, I look at Pacific Colony, which is where the survivors who were quoted at the outset of the presentation were sterilized. And this was a Southern California institution where state authorities um, uh, confined people under this label of people-minded, the same label that was used to argue in the Buck v. Bell Supreme Court case. Um, and it's a place where medical authorities developed and implemented these eugenic theories. And for those of you unfamiliar with um, this label, people-mindedness, it was a broad and flexible diagnosis that was applied to people who were deemed intellectually inferior and socially deviant. Um, and so folks with disabilities, um, but also folks who deviated from you know, ideas of uh, moral or sexual propriety, propriety, people who were involved in criminal um, activity, um, and often low-income people as well. Um, and eugenicists asserted that this condition of people-mindedness was hereditary and a reason why someone should be sterilized. And so what I do in, in my book is I look at how racism and nativism was embedded in this application of feeble-mindedness, um, how ideas about low intelligence and mental defects um, really drew on already existing racism um, and, and the way that California researchers really asserted these qualities of low intelligence as inherent, particularly in Mexican origin youth, um, as evidence of Mexican racial inferiority. And um, data that I present in the book documents this convergence, right? And so it shows that uh, Mexican origin youth, both young women and men, um, over the course of my study made up 21% of admissions to Pacific Colony and 23% of sterilization requests. And this was during a time when the Mexican origin population in the state did not exceed 8%. I also analyzed kind of this gendered application of people mindedness, looking at how um, young Mexican origin women were labeled uh, often sexually delinquent, um, usually because of their engagement in, in sexual behaviors, including um, sex outside of marriage, um, unwed motherhood, single parenting and poverty, and even when they're experiencing sexual violence. So reminiscent again of this Carrie Buck case in the Buck v. Bell uh, Supreme Court case. So here um, is an example of uh, a young 16-year-old um, Mexican origin girl who is described by one Pacific Colony um, clinician as um, a public charge and a moral problem. 
And this is largely due to her repeated contact with men. And the clinician uses these descriptions as justification for sterilization in this, um, which is her sterilization request. Young Mexican origin men were also cast as delinquent, but their delinquency really revolved around charges of quote criminal tendencies. And that was um, a phrase that was used over and over in their sterilization requests. Um, so in this example, a 16 year old boy um, is uh, processed for sterilization and the clinician putting together this um, uh, uh, a request um, describes the parents as, quote, low Mexican type um, and highlights that the young boy has a, a, quote, history of theft and malicious mischief. Um, and so that is the, you know, principal rationale behind um, sterilization. And so, you know, my work builds on kind of the existing um, scholarship around um, the ways that Mexican youth were racialized as um, sexually deviant and um, having criminal tendencies and how during the eugenics era, um, uh, clinicians really uh, legitimized these ideas through labels like people-mindedness and implemented um, eugenic sterilization based on these kind of racist stereotypes. Um, and, and ideas and diagnoses of feeble-mindedness really um, naturalized these stereotypes and then were used to justify um, reproductive violence. Um, so importantly, people who were targeted for sterilization contested and they often resisted the efforts of clinicians and other institutional authorities, and they did so in many different ways. And some of the things that I highlight in my work is um, the ways that they escaped the institution um, and also brought legal suits. So institutional records like this, so this is um, uh, the image in the in the slide, it reveals a long list of, it's just part, a snippet of a long list of um, uh, reports of escapes from an institution. Um, and you'll notice that, you know, John Martinez, Gilbert Macias, and Rosario Valverde all wind up escaping while working in the institution. In the institution. So two of them were working in the ve vegetable garden. One of them was sweeping the floor in a sewing room. And they um, wind up escaping um, as part of a, a way to get away uh, uh, from, you know, um, institutional institutional authority. Um, and another example, um, 21 youths um, collaborated together to escape um, from Pacific Colony. And in a, a number of cases, folks escaped just before being sterilized, right? And so there is kind of a way that folks wind up avoiding um, uh, being sterilized by completely absconding from the institution. Um, let's see. Folks also sought out legal recourse, um, some after being sterilized. Um, in this case, 16-year-old Concepcion Ruiz um, sued California state authorities, um, including the operating doctor, Fred Butler, for $150,000 in damages after she was sterilized in um, uh, Sonoma, which was an institution in Northern California. Almost 10 years later in 1939, um, Andrea Garcia, an 18-year-old girl, um, her mother, Sara Rosas Garcia, winds up seeking legal assistance from the Mexican consulate to prevent um, Andrea's sterilization in um, Pacific Colony. Um, and um, unfortunately, her efforts were unsuccessful, but historical records actually indicate that Andrea was able to escape Pacific Colony before her, her sterilization. And so she wound up, uh, again, avoiding um, sterilization because she wound up escaping. Um, both of the cases were unsuccessful. Concepcion Ruiz's case also was lost, but they remain um, really important records of the way that folks uh, resisted sterilization abuse at the, during this period. 
So um, eugenic sterilizations declined in the 1950s in California, but they continued well into the 1970s in North Carolina. And even after the eugenics period, when eugenic sterilization laws um, are repealed in some states, and eugenics in general kind of falls out of favor, sterilization abuse continues to take place. And they take place largely in public health settings, so county hospitals, Indian health service facilities. And in the 60s and 70s, um, uh, uh, folks wind up bringing uh, more legal suits. So one of them includes um, the Madrigal versus Killigan case in 1978. Um, one of the women who um, is, uh, uh, pictured here in um, this uh, newspaper clipping is a defendant in that case. And she was um, sterilized in the midst of giving birth at a county hospital in Los Angeles. So her and several other women who experienced the same um, sterilization abuse uh, wind up bringing a suit against the hospital. Um, another uh, case that is brought um, in, in the South in Alabama is the case of the Ralph sisters who were um, also sterilized um, in a public, um, uh, in a clinic, in a county um, clinic. Um, you know, in the face of these um, experiences, women um, uh of color across the state um, and or and women organizing around reproductive rights really uh, establish a movement that is aimed at um, combating sterilization abuse and and they create organizations that are meant to confront um, this kind of new episode of sterilization abuse that happens post eugenics. So, you know, despite major inroads that result from the organizing in the 70s and 80s, um, and this included, you know, raising awareness about sterilization abuse, passing important consent policies, um, including waiting periods, um, mandating consent, consent, preventing the use of public funds to, you, to sterilize folks in state um, and, and county hospitals, um, sterilization abuse, you know, persists particularly in carceral settings. And we have several um, more contemporary examples of this. Um, so one of one example includes um, women who were sterilized in California prisons in the 2000s. Um, another example is in Tennessee, a judge who was rep reprimanded for offering reduced jail time to folks um, in exchange for sterilization in 2017. And then uh, most recently, allegations of unwanted hysterectomies that occurred in an immigrant detention center in Georgia. And so, you know, one of the things I'll end here, um, but one of the things that I try to think about is, you know, how do we connect all of these different episodes of sterilization abuse, right? How do we draw uh, parallels while maintaining the nuances of the different episodes, right? And, and, and um, understanding the differences. Um, and, and how do we um, learn from these histories in order to be able to address medical abuse today and prevent uh, future episodes of sterilization abuse? Um, I'll end there, uh, and I will open the floor for comments. Yes, thank you very much, Natalie. Appreciate that. And um, learned a whole bunch there and, and <clears throat> avenues to explore. So as Natalie said, if you have any, if you have any questions out there, if you're tuning in, um, have any questions or comments, feel free to put those um, in the comments section. Um, Natalie, real quick, I'll start off. Um, I noticed um, in uh, one of the maps that you showed at the beginning, um, I'm, I'm asking about um, Illinois being a local history museum. We focus a lot on central Illinois. And like um, one of the maps uh, had Illinois black. And I think that stood for that a bill was pending at that point in 1935 on uh, eugenical sterilization. And then uh, one mm -hmm. of the other sources you showed I looked for Illinois to see if it listed it there, but I didn't see it. But do you know 
um, in your studies of any evidence or study of sterilization abuses in Illinois, Central Illinois, or any any particular cases or stories? I'm sure it exists, but um, just wanted to ask about Illinois in particular. No, so Illinois never passed a, a eugenic sterilization okay. law, luckily. So eugenic sterilization was not a practice in Illinois. However, there were um, similar state institutions. And so instead of sterilizing folks, often um, young women um, who were, again, described as sexual delinquents were um, confined in um, different types of institutions for several years, often um, during the reproductive period. Uh, so, so, you know, luckily our state never passed one of these laws. Um, but, but yeah. Okay, cool. Um, uh, Susan asks, um, what would, what would be classified as mm -hmm. sterilization, you know, specifically? Um, mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, the process was a uh, salpingectomy, which is, um, the two, two, tubal ligations, um, although some folks did have full hysterectomies. Um, it's unclear why the different um, operations were performed, um, but, uh, and then vasectomy, vasectomy for, for men. Um. Look, you know, working at a museum, I'm always interested in, you know, getting deep in the in the archives and the repositories and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then also just in general, if if folks wanted to, you know, look at uh, other resources, you know, and that sort of thing. Of course, you know, you you referenced your book and then also um, the so um, the um, the lab, social justice and sterilization lab, if, I, if I'm saying that correctly. Yes. Could, could you tell us a little bit more about the lab and maybe some other resources to explore if folks are interested in learning more um, about these topics? Of course, yes. So um, the research with the lab is it's great. So we are a, a, an interdisciplinary team. We have um, historians, public health scholars, um, digital humanists. So we actually have a team that is part of the lab that's working on creating um, more um, open source uh, website that has archival material that folks can use to learn about this history and that is working on more um, visualizing some of the data that we've been collecting. Um, but our primary focus right now is building these, um, data, like collecting all of the information on uh, folks that were sterilized in, in the states that we are focusing on right now, which again are California, North Carolina, Iowa, Michigan, and um, we Utah, we just added Utah. Um, and so we're doing that by, you know, scraping information from these archival materials, often sterilization requests, but sometimes like in the case of North Carolina, what we have are, um, North Carolina is interesting because they had a eugenics board. Um, so unlike California, where you had to be committed to a state institution in North Carolina, um, Folks who were institutionalized were sterilized, but also community community dwelling folks were sterilized. So you didn't have to be committed to an institution. Um, you could be referred by a social worker or some other public um, state authority. And so these referrals would go to um, the state eugenics board, which uh, was composed of a uh, a representative from the public health department, a representative from the state's attorney department, um, and a few other officials. Um, and what we have uh, from North Carolina are actually the meeting minutes from the, the eugenics board. And that's where we get in the information from of, of all the people who were recommended to, to, the, to the eugenics board. Um, and so what we're doing is just going through these um, thousands of uh, paper uh, images, in some cases, um, microfilm reels, um, and, and pulling information and creating these data sets so that we can learn both about the dynamics in, in specific states, but also in, in the future, once the, the data sets are complete, being able to talk about um, the states in relation to each other, how they differed, um, you know, what 
types of practices were common across all states and, and what was different and why. Um, and so that's, but you can also find um, resources on our website and I'm happy to share it um, uh, if I can do that. It's the- um, I can drop uh, it in the comments, see. Natalie, if you know it, I can do that real quick. Okay. Yeah, it's ssjlab.org. And we have like a research tab and we have a bunch of articles there, um, you know, both scholarly articles, but also um, essays that we've written. Um, there's also a feature on Sonoma State Ho Hospital, which was um, the institution in California that performed the most sterilizations in that state. Um, about 5,000 of the 20,000 that were performed across the state were performed in Sonoma. And so you can learn a little bit more about that state there or that institution there. Just, um, I was, I was curious is, um, of course you referenced California just being far and away above all these other states, but any particular reason in choosing the other four is, is, is that where, um, you know, you're finding a lot of the, the resources or any, any other rhyme or reason yeah. behind that? Or? So um, one of the reasons is the avail availability of these, sure. this archival material. And so um, for North Carolina, we are able to collaborate with a historian named Joanna Schoen, who um, actually is the one that located the, um, the eugenics board meeting minutes. And so she uh, was very generous in sharing um, uh, PDF images of, of those um, that we've been able to use. Um, and then Michigan um, is because we have our, one of the graduate students that's part of our lab is um, did the, the legwork of finding um, that information in the state archives and, and getting access to that information. We also have one of our public health scholars and epidemiologist, um, Nicole Novak, it's from Iowa, and she did the legwork leg of finding the the data in Iowa, and then um, a researcher in Utah who had access to those records reached out to us and and wanted to collaborate with us, and so that's how those things have been um, playing out. And so, if anyone out there <laughs> wants to see if their state has that information, we would love to work with folks, and we're adding, we're open to adding other states um, in the future. Cool. Thanks for that, Natalie. Um, uh, got some folks sharing some uh, references to sterilization and eugenics in the comments a little bit there. Uh, mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, I'm not seeing, I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions. Maybe one last one, although we kind of touched on it already there at the end. Um, you know, in our contemporary moments, you know, in our here we are in our current historical moment in 2022. You know, we got some unique things uh, taking place mm -hmm. and just maybe just to summarize and wrap it up, you know, why is it important to study, you know, uh, this history and, you know, in, in looking at sterilization abuses and, and eugenics in this country, given the, the current state of things here in 2022? Yeah, I think it's really important because it shows kind of the, the scope of reproductive rights and reproductive rights abuses historically in the country. And, um, you know, understanding the ways that um, oftentimes state programs can be cloaked in um, arguments around humanitarianism because eugenicists saw themselves as, you know, contributing to the betterment of society. Um, many of them really thought that they were doing um, the best thing for folks and for the future of the, their communities by preventing people from reproducing and, and controlling their reproductive rights, um, diminishing their reproductive rights. And I think that that echoes in a lot of, um, you know, uh, things that are happening right now, particularly around um, abortion, you know, I think it's a it's an another side of that spectrum, um, and you know my my work and the work of the social sterilization and social justice lab is really founded and, and grounded in um, the idea of the framework of um, reproductive justice, which is a framework that um, is established on three pillars, right? 
the right to um, have children, the right to not have children using the um, the means that are appropriate for you in your moment in life and the right to raise your children and to uh, create families in safe and sustainable environments. And that those three pillars are connected. And so while the bulk of my research looks at kind of the right to have children in the face of sterilization abuse, um, it's still deeply connected to other uh, reproductive justice pillars, including, you know, the right to not have children. Um, and so I think, you know, being able to see um, the way that these things are connected um, is really is powerful. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Thank you for that, Natalie. And thank you. Um, you know, thank you for all your work. Thank you for the presentation tonight. Thank you, you know, to the lab. Um, I, I, I wish you all the best and the success and in, in, in combing through all of those, you know, thousands of <laughs> Of, of, of resources, but it's um, very important work and, 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 and really appreciate the lab and, and, and you, you know, leading that, that effort as well. Um, and thanks to um, everybody for tuning in um, tonight. Um, feel free to uh, continue to leave questions or comments here, um, uh, you know, after the fact as well. Um, and, and, and thank you to Rose. Thank you, Rose, for providing yeah. ASL interpretation. Um, really appreciate that also. Um, and hope to see you all at future programs, um, uh, virtual programs, or even in person um, at the Museum of the Grand Prairie. So for Natalie, for Rose, for myself, um, we, will, we will call it a night. Until next time. Thank you.